Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to Bartley's Commentaries in the Cosmic Wars. I'm going to start off by reading from a book entitled Operation Fortitude, the story of the spy operation that saved D-Day, because it deals specifically with strategic deception. And I wanted to address some issues before moving on to other related topics. I'm going to talk about a wide variety of subjects today. Pakistan, Afghanistan, the Haitian invasion, just a variety of subjects. So hang on to your hats. I think this is going to be a good one. Again, the title of the book is Operation Fortitude, the story of the spy operation that saved D-Day, written by Joshua Levine. I'm going to talk about a guy, Colonel Dudley Rangel Clark. Those of you who watch the television series about the British SAS and their origins in North Africa in World War II will remember Colonel Dudley Clark. He was an interesting individual. I'll talk more about him. Uh, Let me read from the book. The comprehensive system of strategic deception was developed more or less single-handedly by Lieutenant Colonel Dudley Rangel Clark. Clark was a dynamic little man with carefully slick blonde hair and haunting blue eyes who had already made a valuable contribution to the war effort before he turned as an orthodox mind to deception in the days following the evacuation of Allied soldiers from Dunkirk in mid-1940. He had been chatting with General Sir John Dill, the chief of the Imperial General Staff. We must find some way, said Dill, of helping the army to exercise its offensive spirit once again. Clark had grown up in the Transvaal, and he thought back to the Boer commandos, loose-knit bands of horsemen used as guerrillas to strike against the British during the Boer War. He suggested the formation of a modern equivalent which could hit sharp and quick, then run to fight another day. One of Clark's first commandos was actor David Niven. So he not only came up with the idea, Lieutenant Colonel Dudley Clark, for the famed British commandos, but it was his later strategic deception which gave rise to the British Special Air Service. So I'm going to read another part here that's critical to understand as far as strategic deception is concerned. Clark's first deception plan for General Wavell was Operation Camilla, an attempt to make the Italians think that an attack was to be mounted on occupied British Somaliland by troops based in Egypt when in fact the real attack was to be made on Eritrea by troops in the Sudan. Clark spared no effort in thinking up ways of misleading Italian intelligence. Raids were launched on Somaliland by air and sea to make it seem as though an assault must follow. Campaign maps and pamphlets relating to Somaliland were issued to British troops. The airwaves were bombarded with fake wireless traffic and the Japanese consul in Port Said was tipped off that an attack on Somaliland was imminent. In the event, the plan managed to succeed and simultaneously to fail utterly. The Italian commander certainly believed that Wavell was intending to attack Somaliland, but deciding that the attack could not be resisted, he removed his troops from Somaliland and sent them to Eritrea, where their presence made the actual assault for far more difficult than it would have been without the deception plan. This misfortune proved to be a valuable learning experience for Clark. His response was to formulate his first rule of strategic deception, to make your opponent act as you want him to. It doesn't matter what he thinks. In this case, the Italian commander was led to expect an attack on Somaliland, but Clark hadn't considered what he would do as a result. The deceiver, he realized, had to get inside the mind of the enemy commander. On this occasion, he had failed. In future, Clark would make a point of asking his commander, what do you want the enemy to do? And very often, to his surprise, the commander would be unable to answer. So Clark said, I developed the trick of asking them to imagine that I had a direct telephone line to Hitler and that he would do anything I told him to do. And this proved quite successful. During Operation Fortitude, Clark's golden rule would sit above all others as the one to be obeyed. So the key takeaway I got from that was, it's not enough to get into the head of the enemy. 
and make them think or believe something. The key behind strategic deception is to make the enemy do what you want them to do, not just think or believe something, but actually do. And sometimes not doing something, instilling a paralysis of inaction, can accomplish the same goal. Let's take the recent assassination attempt on President Trump. Now, there's at least three different ways you can look at it, and there are different target populations involved in all three perspectives. Let me explain. For the surface-level truther, the glass-half-full type who sees conspiracies everywhere and who is constantly bemoaning the fact that everyone is controlled opposition, can't trust anyone, the Simpsons predicted this, that, and the other. You know the type I'm talking about. Now, there are plenty of curiosities, let's say, oddities about the assassination attempt to give anyone pause for thought if they really thought about it. Okay, I have misgivings about it myself, but I zoom out and I maintain neutral buoyancy. I don't get emotionally involved. So to a glass half full surface level type, They'll just go on and on and on about how it was a setup, it was fake, he was never meant to be assassinated, there's an agenda behind it. So by now you would have come across this lot of virtue signaling. And really, that message, it bespeaks hopelessness, despair, defeatism. So the assassination attempt, so-called, is going to have an effect on that demographic of people in a very predictable way. They will start chirping about how it was not a real assassination attempt. They're going to do what's expected of them. Their response is entirely predictable. Right off the bat, a considerable swath of the surface-level so-called truth community has been effectively neutralized. They've got them to do exactly what they wanted them to do. So discord, divisiveness into the truth movement by parading the spectacle of what appears to be or is supposed to have been a botched assassination attempt. Case closed as far as that demographic is concerned. Another target population is the, I hate to use a term, but for lack of a better term, a term in popular usage, right-wing Christian conservatives, some of whom have a decidedly Christian Zionist bent, and also have either recent military experience or current military experience. What they perceive to be a real assassination attempt that has gone wrong, and by divine providence, Trump had survived, this is the effect it's having on them. They will rally around Trump even more. Trump has already said that if he won the election, he's all in with war on Iran. He's all in with helping Israel in any way, even to the point of deporting people who criticize Israel or criticize the slaughter in Gaza. I'll preface what I'm going to say by pointing out that I look at things from a short-term, intermediate, long-term perspective. In the short term, anything must be done, legally that is, of course, there's the disclaimer, to prevent the Harris-Waltz team from taking over the administration for another four years, because that would be absolutely disastrous. We will see an endless string of false flag attacks, and there are a lot of players out there that want to have have their say in the matter insofar as conducting real terrorist attacks. That's how many enemies America has got by this point. So Pamela Harris and Waltz are a short-term threat. So not voting for Trump is an automatic vote for Kamala Harris and Waltz. Voting for a no-hoper libertarian or independent just to score virtue signaling points. Oh, I'm not falling for both wings of the same bird, oppo sames, etc. I'm going to vote for a libertarian or an independent that has no hope of winning. And in effect, that's the same as voting for a Kamala Harris Waltz ticket. And the Kamala Waltz administration and the puppeteers behind them are intent on starting a nuclear war with the Russians. Make no mistake about that. So that possibility, that threat is always there. Now, the way I look at it, in a lesser of two evils kind of thing, and I have misgivings about this assassination attempt, just like a lot of other people do. 
But from a short-term perspective, it's far better to have Trump in there because at least a lot of people will be hanging on to his coattails and will go into the administration, into the bureaucracies, into the various federal agencies that have a conservative Christian mindset, mentality, constitutional mentality, and they can do their level best to slow down the process of this Bolshevik communist tidal wave we're having to put up with. If they can't outright stop certain agendas, at least they can slow things down, exert bureaucratic inertia, bureaucratic resistance from the inside. At this point, beggars can't be choosers. If you look at it from a lesser of two evil standpoint, I think at least in the short term, that's the way to go. Because if Harris and Waltz take over for another four years, it will be hell on earth and hell in America in particular. At least the Trump victory, if they allow it to come to pass and not rig it again, there would be enough people, enough constitutionally minded people to take over key positions. And they may have the ability to slow things down. Okay, so I'm not asking for the moon and Saturn and, and all these other planets. I'm not asking for much. I'm just asking for just slow things down. Just a little bit of time. Another demographic that has been affected, clearly has been affected by the Trump assassination attempt, so-called, is the mouth-foaming, Kennedy-infested liberals, the woke left, the deranged left. Immediately upon the failed assassination, there were all these calls for further attempts to assassinate Trump. Jack Black infamously did so in a concert in Australia, which led to his entire tour being canceled in Australia. What an idiot. No talent bum anyway. Who needs him? These liberals see no contradiction in demanding gun control, demanding the necessity of stripping law-abiding citizens of their guns and their firearms and everything else, but they have absolutely no qualms about calling for further assassinations on Trump. And recently there was another failed attempt and the background on that guy, he looks like a whack job. Supposedly he appeared, and I there's no I haven't confirmed this yet, I haven't had the time, but supposedly he appeared on yet another BlackRock commercial, so we're already starting to see these certain patterns emerge, which will get the tongues wagging, especially amongst the service level types. Back when Otrama was in office, well he's still running the show, at least on behalf of his masters, but at any rate, back during the Obama administration you criticize Obama to the slightest degree, within minutes, practically, feds would be at your door. They really, really put the stamp of Bolshevism, of communism, into place. Especially with Clinton, you saw that really coming in hard. It had been going on all along with liberal Democrats, especially with Clinton. Then it went into overdrive with Obama. Point being is that there is yet another example of a particular demographic, in this case, the mouth-foaming woke tards, going crazy about the Trump assassination attempt, but for all the wrong reasons. They want bloodshed, they want more death, they want more destruction. These are entity-infested sewer scum. So right there, I've given you three examples, and there's probably more if I really wanted to split hairs, about how this failed assassination attempt, or what appears to have been a failed assassination attempt, had such a profound effect on so many people across the board. And this harkens back to what I said at the outset, when I quoted from the book about Operation Fortitude, the strategic deception that led up to and continued, actually, after the Normandy landings, D-Day. The purpose behind a psychological warfare operation is to make the targeted population, the enemy, if you will, in our example, to do something, to do a certain thing, to partake in a certain set or sequence of activities, which benefits those who created the psychological warfare operation in the first place. So instead of doing something constructive, people are splitting hairs, it's fake, it was on The Simpsons, and another response is, oh yes, when Trump is in, we'll go to war with Iran on behalf of Israel, and 
Yet another example is mouth foaming, uh, hand wringing, wailing, and gnashing of teeth from these whack job liberals. Three behaviors induced by the same event. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. This is positively the last time these military people have to stay on the right side of history, to do something right instead of following orders. Even in the recent past, we've seen civilian law enforcement mindlessly following orders. Uh, these concerned citizens in Colorado saying the migrants are doing this, they're doing that, they're in gangs, they're taking over apartment buildings. And cops are saying, and this is on video, cops are saying, we can't do anything about it, it's a sanctuary city following orders yet again. If you can't be a proper police officer, resign, let someone else in there who may do some good instead of being a mindless order follower. Mindless order followers who institute and maintain the lockdowns, the unconstitutional search and seizure of people, possessions, property, papers, and who bring in hordes of raping, stabbing, pet-eating immigrants, whack-job scum from the third world. Before I segue into the next part, I want to read a bit, a couple of pages from a book called Top Gun, The Real Story, written by Dan Peterson, founder of the U.S. Navy's Top Gun program. You cannot write this guy off as a conspiracy theorist. He was the guy who founded Top Gun and naval aviation. What the military or ex-military people were all gung-ho to support that little country in the Middle East at all costs to listen to what I'm going to say next, because this applies to them. Conceived in Washington by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara and approved by President Johnson, our bombing campaign was meant not to destroy the enemy's ability to wage war. It wasn't designed to demolish their air defense network so we could operate over North Vietnam with impunity. It had nothing to do with tangible results or victory. It had everything to do with sending gradual messages to Hanoi. Where I had expected to be the tip of the spear, we were instead the thumb and forefinger of Lyndon Johnson's gradual escalation of pressure on the North Vietnamese. We weren't allowed to apply pressure anywhere that it might hurt. We were allowed just to pinch their metaphorical shoulder as a warning that if they didn't behave, we would pinch harder. Gradual escalation of pressure on an enemy was a strategy conceived by people who probably had never even been in a schoolyard fight against a bully. Imagine the school bells ringing at the end of the day. You head out to walk home, and along the way you see a bully beating up on a younger kid. You go over to help, but instead of knocking down the bully, you tap him lightly on the back of the head and say, Keep that up, and I'll get serious. What's the bully going to do? The Rolling Thunder campaign was LBJ's personal billy club. He would send us to smack the North Vietnamese for sending supplies and troops to the insurgents then order unilateral stand-downs, known as bombing pauses, to give the North Vietnamese time to internalize the punishment and heed its lesson. But the pauses just gave them time to rearm. The American response seemed only to embolden Hanoi and convince its leadership that we were more worried about widening the war and possibly fighting China or the Soviet Union than we were about defeating them. They used the bombing pauses to resupply and prepare for the next onslaught. A lot of Americans died as a result. Some were friends of mine. On Yankee Station, the Enterprise Air Wing learned what this meant to individual air crews. Johnson and McNamara micromanaged the losing air war from Washington, D.C., going so far as to pick our targets. There were perhaps 150 worthwhile things to bomb in North Vietnam. Airfields, military bases, supply facilities, power plants, bridges, rail centers, oil and lubricant facilities, a few steel mills, and of course, Haiphong port facilities. As both China and Russia wanted to be Hanoi's primary ally, they tried to one-up each other with military support. Large convoys of weapons and war material flowed across the Chinese border into Vietnam, while the Russians heavy-hauled tanks and surface-to-air missile systems via cargo ships to Haiphong Harbor. The enemy thus had sanctuary to bring in whatever was needed and for years, and keep that point about a sanctuary in mind because that's exactly what Pakistan has been for so long for terrorism. Rate of escalating the war, the Johnson administration refused to sanction attacks on Haiphong Harbor or the shipping there. As we started flying missions up north, we would pass near the, those cargo ships 
as they waited their turn to offload at the docks. We could see their decks cram with weatherized MiGs and surface-to-air missiles that would shortly be used against us. MiGs were the Soviet-made uh, fighter planes, but we couldn't hit them. And we couldn't mine the harbor either. What a tragedy. The simple execution of an off-the-shelf aerial mining plan long before perfected during World War II and carried out in three days could have shut down that big port, the only one of its kind in North Vietnam. But the word from the White House was no. Those big surface-to-air missiles as large as telephone poles would spear up into the sky after our aircraft, homing on their radar signatures. They took a heavy toll. We could seldom bomb the missile sites for fear we might kill their Russian advisors. When the North Vietnamese began flying Russian and Chinese-built MiG fighters, the Navy and Air Force asked Washington for permission to bomb their airfields. The request was denied. Categories of targets that could not be struck under any circumstances included dams, hydroelectric plants, fishing boats, sampans, and houseboats. They also included significantly populated areas. Seeing the military value of these restrictions, the North Vietnamese placed most of their SAM, that surface-to-air missile sites, support facilities, and other valuable cargo near Hanoi and Haiphong, places we were forbidden to strike. The airfields around Hanoi became sanctuaries for the MiGs. The commander-in-chief of U.S. Pacific Command, Admiral Ulysses S. Grant Sharp, who had overall responsibility for the air war, urged the Joint Chiefs to lift the crippling restrictions. Meanwhile, the enemy fighter pilots could sit on their runways in, the, in their planes without fear of attack, waiting to scramble when our bombers showed up. Eventually, Johnson and McNamara caved to pressure and agreed to allow strikes on the airfields, yet they micromanaged even this, picking specific airfields and leaving others out of bounds. Quote, it was always necessary virtually to beg target authorization out of Washington bit by piece, Admiral Sharp wrote. Instead of letting the Navy launch a blitz that might break the back of the North Vietnamese Air Force, we hit a few air bases at a time while leaving the rest unscathed. And this is an important point right here. Post-war research suggests that Hanoi occasionally received updated target lists about the same time we did on Yankee Station. Yankee Station was the point offshore of North Vietnam where the U.S. carriers, where they launched their airstrikes at North Vietnam and other places north of the 17th parallel. Post-war research suggests that Hanoi occasionally received updated target lists about the same time we did on Yankee Station. Our own State Department passed the list to North Vietnamese via the Swiss government in hopes that Hanoi would evacuate civilians from the target areas. Of course, they cared little about that. They simply used the valuable intel to duck the next onslaught, moving MiGs out of harm's way and bolstering anti-aircraft artillery and surface-to-air missile batteries in the target areas for good measure. Destroying the MiGs on the ground proved difficult enough, but we were also ordered not to attack them in the air unless they could be visually identified and posed a direct threat. This was a setup for failure, and it got a lot worse. And it goes on from there. So he had to create Top Gun in spite of all these handicaps. And to this day, service-level truthers who've come under the malign influence of leftist academics and leftist journalists are the first to scream whenever someone brings up General Curtis LeMay, oh, Dr. Strangelove, no, Dr. Strangelove was about the wheelchair-bound, paperclip German technical advisor or scientist played by Peter Sellers. It wasn't referring to the general, the Air Force general. I don't know where they get that weird connection also. Point being is that General LeMay suggested the same thing. Look, there's no point doing this, being in a war in Southeast Asia, if you're not going to let our air forces and naval air forces do their job and at the very least mine Haiphong Harbor because the Soviets and the Chinese and other East Bloc countries were bringing in cargo vessels full of weapons and equipment for North Vietnam so they can also supply the insurgency, the Viet Cong insurgency in South Vietnam. These were all common sense suggestions that the people at the spear point, the ones actually flying the planes, 
in combat what they would have liked to have done. Attack the airfields, attack the command and control centers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Not only were they denied that opportunity, their very own State Department was passing on target lists, which the Naval Air Forces and the U.S. Air Force were shortly to bomb. And that's just one example of perfidy, treachery, backstabbing at very high levels. And the reason I went to such great lengths to read that to you, and I'm, this is directed, not that any of you are actually going to listen to me, but uh, to the military people out there who are all gung-ho for another war, these double crosses all the way down the line, they've been going on for so long, and the military people were always at the butt end of that dirty practical joke. Henry Kissinger said it best, military people are dumb, stupid animals who, who are pawns in foreign policy, and his definition of foreign policy includes wars. So if you people, you military types, allow yourselves to be suckered in again and help push this planet into thermonuclear war, do not tell yourselves you are good guys. I was watching this documentary. It was about these Marines, U.S. Marines in, uh, where was it, Fallujah, I think it was. They also videotaped and interviewed these Marines after their tour of duty, where they were having to deal with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, mental distress. And the experience of the combat there in Iraq was so traumatic that it really did a number on a lot of these veterans. And one guy in particular, he's an American citizen, but he's also a dual South American citizen of some kind. I can't remember which Central or South America country he was from, but after his time in Vietnam, or rather Iraq, excuse me, he went back not to live in the U.S., but to live in, in Latin America. And they were interviewing this this guy, and he was saying, because he'd taken part in a house raid in Iraq and wound up like almost 100% disabled. And he said, my condition, my permanent crippled condition, I did this for you people. All you people safe at home, I was fighting your war for you. No, you were not. You were fighting on behalf of the Zionist Yanan plan. And the uh, latest iteration of that was the plan put forth by Richard Pearl, dual-use citizen. Richard Pearl, knows the Black Prince, headed up the Defense Policy Board. That was in the Republican administration. I think it was Bush 1. And he wrote a clean break, which was an extension of the Yanan plan of creating a greater Israel, Haaretz Israel, at the expense of its surrounding countries, the surrounding neighboring Arab countries. One of the key points of the Yanan plan, and later elaborated upon by the plan put forth by Richard Pearl, a clean break, was to break up the surrounding Arab countries into their constituent parts, uh, turn the southern part of Iraq into a Shia stronghold, turn the central part into a Sunni stronghold, turn the northern part of Iraq into a Kurdish stronghold. And that's basically exactly what they did. And I'll go into some of the mechanics of that also, because it, it underscores the whole double-cross dynamic and how these are wars that were never meant to be won. Never meant to be won. So this Marine, this injured Marine, yeah, I, I got sympathy for him because he got injured fighting in a, a war for all the wrong reasons. Of course, you have 9-11 and the bogus justification behind that. Then suddenly they shift emphasis from Afghanistan to Iraq, invade Iraq in March 2003. It was during the fighting, during the conflict in Iraq that these Marines got injured. And the one guy is saying, well, I all my injuries, I did this for you people. And you people, he was castigating us and lambasting us. You people don't even appreciate what we went through, blah, blah, blah. Quack, quack, quack. Now, wait a minute. I'm not accepting that because you went into it blinders on. You followed directions. You followed orders. And you went and you invaded people's homes. And it's their right to stand up to you. It's their right to defend their homes against people like you. And now, as a direct result of all these invasions, it's created these so-called war refugees. And with all these war refugees, they soon became immigrants. And many of these war refugees slash immigrants, whether they're from uh, Iraq, whether they're from the efforts at destabilizing Syria, whether it was because of destroying Libya and allowing the jihadists to take over there, all these wars create the pretext for safely evacuating war refugees. Every time they drop a bomb in an Arab Muslim country, 
you create that many more so-called war refugees and somehow, some way, they wind up in the West where so many of them cause so many problems. So the point of relevance to this is I didn't accept from that wounded Marine his mentality, his justification that, oh, I endured all this for you ungrateful people. No, you didn't do anything to help us. You made the world an infinitely more dangerous place. And that phony appeal at the start of the war on terror, well, we got to fight them over there, way over there in Afghanistan and other places, rather than fight them here in our backyard. Well, take a look around now. You have all these Muslims and jihadists running around stabbing people, gang-raping women, gang-raping little children, protected by the Bolshevik system in true Frankfurt school fashion. You want high-value targets? There's your high-value targets right there. All these sewer scum going around stabbing people and burning down churches and the whole nine yards. And they're being armed. They're being supplied with weapons. They're being supplied with machetes. They've been turned loose against the largely white native population of Europe. And if you guys in the military fall for it again, again, do not look in the mirror and certainly don't tell us that you're doing this for us. That level of incompetence and stupidity... I do not suffer fools gladly, and I will not put up with anyone trying to big-time me, big-shot me. Oh, I'm a tier one level operator, and I'm doing all this for you, and I'm going around chasing bad guys. STF you. All your tier one targets are going around stabbing people in Paris and in Berlin and London, increasingly in America. Because the very same regime that's going to send you off to fight on behalf of greater Israel is the same regime that's opened up the borders and bringing in all these Haitians and everyone else. And it's time you woke up to that fact. Next, I'm going to talk about Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq, and how that ties into the immigrant invasion and the deliberate implosion destruction of the West. I'm going to read from Ahmed Rashid's book, Descent into Chaos. The subtitle of the book is Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the Threat to Global Security. I'm going to read some excerpts, and then I'm going to provide some background commentary about it, because Ahmed Rashid is essentially a mainstream surface-type historian. For example, he hews closely to the official 9-11 narrative. But that much being said, he does provide a lot of insight about that part of the world, insight that really isn't available anywhere else. The Taliban were now cornered at two extreme ends of the country, in Kandahar, where Mullah Omar held out, and in the northeast corner in Kunduz, where the Taliban were joined by surviving Arab, Central Asian, and Pakistani fighters, some 8,000 in all. The Arabs insisted on fighting to the death. The Taliban wanted to surrender to U.S. forces rather than to the Northern Alliance commanders who had surrounded them on all sides. Das Tum and his Uzbeks were to the west of the city, and Tajik generals Atta and Dad to the south. There was intense rivalry between these two factions as they both wanted to capture any al-Qaeda leader for whom the CIA had promised large cash rewards. Dostum held secret negotiations with Mullah Dadullah, a senior Taliban commander, and offered to give the Taliban free passage to Kandahar as long as Dadullah handed over the Arabs. The Taliban feared they would be killed if they surrendered to the Northern Alliance. Speaking to anyone they could on their wireless, the Taliban commanders offered to surrender to U.S. forces, the U.N. or the International Committee of the Red Cross. They even offered to surrender to Karzai, anyone but the Northern Alliance. Jacob Kellenberger, the president of the ICRC, who was visiting Islamabad, was pressed by Musharraf to save the surrounded Taliban. But in Kabul, Kellenberger was unable to get any guarantees for their safety. He went to Washington to talk to Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice. CENTCOM declined to accept the Taliban members' surrender, while the UN and other international organizations said they had no capacity to accept such large surrenders. The Pentagon wanted it both ways, declining any responsibility for surrendered Taliban, but wanting to interrogate any high-level al-Qaeda prisoners. General Tommy Franks could easily have put the U.S. troops waiting in Uzbekistan on the ground in Kunduz to accept an orderly Taliban surrender. The absence of U.S. troops, I believe, led to the deaths of thousands of Taliban prisoners at the hands of the Northern Alliance and the escape of top Taliban and al-Qaeda leaders, an escape that was to be repeated in Tora Bora a few weeks later when Franks again refused to deploy U.S. troops 
Until the end of November, when some U.S. troops were deployed to help capture Kandahar, Franks did not deploy any American soldiers. It was a major strategic mistake and it had awful consequences. It had resulted in the leaders of the Taliban and al-Qaeda escaping. And uh, there's a lot to unpack there. It was an example of a deliberate stand down. One thing you will notice when you study these campaigns, these Council on Foreign Relations, so-called wars that were never meant to be won, you will see a persistent pattern when victory could have been had in the early stages of the campaign. Okay, that was in the early stages of the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. They already had the, the Taliban cornered in the northeastern part of the country. The U.S. had allied itself with the Northern Alliance warlords. They would conveniently gotten rid of Ahmed Shah Massoud, who was bumped off a couple of days before 9-11, blamed on al-Qaeda, of course. Massoud would have been the one individual to hold this alliance together. With him out of the way, the Northern Alliance became factionalized, which each tribal grouping, some of these commanders, warlords were from Central Asia. They each had their own competing agenda, and they had their own grievances and beefs against the Taliban. It must be remembered that the Taliban were foreign to Afghanistan. They were trained up in the madrasas in Pakistan under the auspices of the Pakistan Inner Services Intelligence, and then they were sent into Afghanistan because Pakistan had long feared the possibility of India, their longtime rival, gaining influence in Pakistan. New nation building was never in the cards as far as Afghanistan and Iraq were concerned. Had Ahmad Shah Massoud still been in charge of the Northern Alliance, it's possible he would have prevented the wholesale slaughter of not only the Taliban, but a lot of the populace at the hands of a vengeful Northern Alliance. That's not how you build nations, by allowing these warlords to come in and just start massacring people indiscriminately. Not just the Taliban, but people in general. There were a lot of rapes, there was a lot of thievery, there was a lot of unnecessary killings. The Northern Alliance warlords were paid a bounty by the CIA, over well over a billion dollars, the CIA paid to the individual Northern Alliance warlords. In the southern part of Afghanistan, Helmand province, places like that, the Taliban there had more of an ethnic connection to the locals because they were Pashtuns, a lot of the Taliban in the southern part of Afghanistan, and they were allied with the Pashtuns in the western part of Pakistan. problem in the southern part of Afghanistan was the Afghanistan police that were going around raping little boys and uh, doing all kinds of evil things. And then there was the Afghanistan army operating in the southern part of Afghanistan. And one of the problems with the Afghanistan army was most of the members of the Afghanistan army were not ethnic Pashtuns. They came from the northern part of Afghanistan where the primary uh, dialect was uh, Dari, a dialect of Persian, of Farsi. So it was a recipe for disaster, really. With the ousting of the Taliban in the northern part of Afghanistan, a lot of these warlords set up their own protection rackets. Uh, They began charging tariffs and tolls to travelers going in and out of Pakistan into Afghanistan, They began extorting all kinds of money from and crops from the local people in the north. They were engaged in all kinds of wrongdoing and criminal activity. And that's who the CIA and the U.S. allied themselves with. Again, this was after Ahmed Shah Massoud was conveniently gotten out of the way shortly before 9-11. So keep that point in mind also. So getting back to the story, within just a few months... The Taliban could have been finished off in Kunduz, but what happened was General Tommy Franks did not deploy troops in order to cut off the escape of the Taliban, and the Pakistani Air Force, using Lockheed C-130 Hercules transports, airlifted out large numbers of Taliban and Al-Qaeda, especially the leadership. 
of Al Qaeda. And this was repeated not too long afterwards in Tora Bora, where the U.S. military was stood down. Once again, Tommy Franks, the general of CENTCOM. And remember, I read that passage a moment ago. CENTCOM wanted nothing to do with the surrender of the Taliban. So what was the purpose anyway of invading the place if they didn't want to get rid of the Taliban who were allegedly harboring bin Laden and al-Qaeda? Why indeed? The whole process was repeated in Tora Bora where hundreds, if not thousands, of Taliban and al-Qaeda once again airlifted out by Pakistani Air Force C-130s while the Americans were stood down. So they were prolonging the war, prolonging the war unnecessarily. They could have ended it right there. And look at the aftermath of Tora Bora, because that happened on the heels of Kunduz. The Taliban and al-Qaeda were allowed to escape in Kunduz, and shortly after, they were cornered and trapped in Tora Bora, were allowed to escape again. And what did we begin to see back at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, from some of the Special Forces soldiers, Army Special Forces soldiers, who witnessed this. Well, we began to have suicides. We began to have suicide murders where allegedly these disgruntled, traumatized, gone crazy Army Special Forces guys committed suicide, but not before killing their wives, wiping the slate clean because these Army Special Forces guys were venting their frustrations about having to watch, on two occasions, the Taliban and al-Qaeda escape when they had them in the bag for long the war. And then what they did was they shifted the emphasis from Afghanistan to Iraq. So they began drawing down, reducing the troop levels, telling everybody that they've solved the problem with the Taliban and al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. But when they didn't, they allowed them to escape. They drew down their forces and they built up their forces in preparation for the invasion of Iraq. And we will see a replay of that later on when it looked like they were going to finish off the insurgency, if you want to call it that, in Iraq. Then suddenly they stopped, drew things down, and shifted the emphasis to Afghanistan again, but not before setting up the conditions to allow Iraq to be broken up into its constituent parts pursuant to the Yunnan plan and a clear break as planned out by Richard Pearl. Getting back to the role of Pakistan, I knew that this notion that Pakistan was going to be our main ally in the global war on terror was a non-starter because for so long, the Pakistani army, and it must be noted that for a long time, Pakistan was regarded as an army with a state rather than a state with an army. Uh, the Pakistani army increasingly Islamicized over the years, had for a long time been training terrorists and extremists for the ongoing conflict in Kashmir vis-a-vis uh, -vis India. So they've been training up terrorists to wage war against the Indians for a long time. And I stated previously, and this is well documented, that the Pakistani army and particularly the inter-services intelligence of the Pakistani military trained up what became the Taliban. So the Taliban and al-Qaeda were rescued, were brought into Pakistan in North Waziristan, uh, the federally administered tribal areas, other places. These became sanctuaries and training and recruitment grounds for the surviving Taliban who were able to build up their strength. Uh, likewise, al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda would just move around and their names were changed to destabilize Iraq, ironically, and other places. Again, we have that familiar pattern where in the Vietnam War, you had the long border between uh, Vietnam, both North Vietnam and South Vietnam, with Laos in the north and then Cambodia further south. And these were sanctuaries for the North Vietnamese Army as well as the Viet Cong. Everything that Nixon tried to do later in the war should have been done, if there were serious about winning the Vietnam War, should have been done much earlier. Uh, the clandestine invasions of Laos, bombing and invasion of Cambodia, if they were serious, and I talked earlier about 
the importance of, of mining Haiphong Harbor and turning loose the Air Force and naval aviation against the the shipping in Haiphong Port and other places. If they were serious about stopping and ending the war, those are the things you do. Instead, they allow these sanctuaries along the long border with Vietnam in Laos and Cambodia to be fully manned by their enemy, the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong. We see a similar dynamic in Pakistan, where the Pakis brought in back to Pakistan all these Taliban, all these Al-Qaeda, and provided sanctuary, safe harbor, arms, trainers, advisors, etc., and allowed the Pakistan based at this point Taliban and Al Qaeda to grow in numbers and recruit and train in perfect safety. Eventually a homegrown Taliban was formed within Pakistan, which ironically began trying to destabilize Pakistan. So the notion from the outset that Pakistan was going to be our great allies was a non starter. That didn't even make sense at any level. But then just to fast forward a little bit, the incessant drone bombings of the Obama administration, blasting uh, wedding parties and claiming that they were meetings of high-value targets, and then a few days later, blasting the funerals for the people killed at the wedding, saying that the people that were blasted at the funeral were high-value targets. And this was inside Pakistan that this was happening at. So we're talking about an outrageous violation of another country's sovereignty, never mind it was Pakistan and they were training all these terrorists. It's that whole conflicted, contradictory, you're either with us or against us. We saw that play out in spades with this contradictory, paradoxical, on the surface, relationship the U.S. had with Pakistan, and by extension, Pakistan had by supporting the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and other extremist groups, because they'd set up a lot of terrorist training camps, the Pakistanis did. And also remember that Pakistan was double-crossed big time as a result of 9-11. They were told by the U.S., the CIA, and Mossad to train up all these Taliban. The next thing you know, they're accused, Pakistan is accused of being involved in 9-11. And they're expected to be supportive of America's global war on terror. A large chunk of Pakistan's foreign debt to the U.S. was... Uh, forgiven as an inducement to help in the war on terror. And on top of that, large loans were given by the World Bank and by the U.S. to Pakistan, which never made its way. The money never made its way to the populace, the Pakistani populace, where illiteracy is through the roof and is just really a basket case of a country in many ways. All that money went straight to the military and the military parsed out some of that money to the same groups of terrorists that they've been training all along. So one could say with absolute certainty that the Pakistani army and the Pakistani state has a huge grievance against the U.S. for being blamed for 9-11 and for being lukewarm in their support on the global war on terror. Add on to that the incessant drone bombings of the Obama administration you had the fake bin Laden raid, which was another gross violation of Pakistani national sovereignty. And if people are out there listening and are offended by that, what do you mean the fake bin Laden raid? Well, riddle me this. How did all those members of DevGru, commonly referred to as SEAL Team 6, wind up in a rickety old National Guard helicopter in the aftermath of the bin Laden mission, which was conveniently shot down, supposedly by the Taliban? Well, were the Taliban tipped off, or were there other deep state players at work wiping out some of the very members of, of DevGru that were involved in the bin Laden mission to wipe the slate clean once again? Never hear any of these ex-Special Forces guys in these many podcasts, which I listen to and watch, they never get into this. They never, ever delve into this how so many of the members of DevGru were killed in the aftermath of that bin Laden mission. The mission itself was real. Whether they actually got bin Laden, that's another story entirely. 
But what we do know for an absolute fact is many members of that assault team were taken out, conveniently blamed on the Taliban, who just happened to be there along the route that this helicopter was taking all these Navy SEALs that happened to be on the mission, and they were taken out. Dead men tell no tales. No different than the Army Special Forces guys who were suicided or murder-suicided in Fort Bragg and other places in the aftermath of Hundus and Bora Bora operations. The whole incompetence excuse only lasts so long. Of course, we still have the same command that was responsible for the meltdown in Kunduz and Tora Bora, also in command in Iraq, uh, General Tommy Franks. I'm going to read to you now from a book called Losing Small Wars, British Military Failure in Iraq and Afghanistan, written by Frank Ledwidge, who was a former member of the British military who served in Iraq. The British operated the southern part of Iraq in the Basra area, which was a heavily Shia area as compared to the so-called Sunni Triangle further north, uh, which encompassed Baghdad. Let me read you some excerpts, which I think you'll find interesting, because it was a foreshadowing of what was going to happen in Britain and in America when you have the wrong forces set up to be the militia or to be the police forces. Right now, they're trying to push through the U.S. Congress a bill banning militias, banning militias. And, of course, that won't fly constitutionally because it's enshrined in the Constitution that each state must allow, provide for a well-regulated militia. Okay, getting on with the story. In the early days of the occupation, there was little understanding of who constituted a true threat to the force or the mission. These were not necessarily the same thing. Largely ineffective and sporadic attacks on the British did not necessarily constitute a serious threat to the overall mission. Conversely, serious threats to the mission, insofar as a coherent mission could be discerned, took the form of attacks upon the people of Basra. Untroubled by the British, the various Shia militias were hard at work eliminating as many of the former regime loyalists, or FRLs, as they could. These Ba'athists had enough problems simply staying alive without attacking the British forces. The Shia militia's approach toward anyone with the slightest connection to the former regime was horrific torture and murder, and bodies were found daily. It must be said that there was a view held by very many at all rank levels of the British forces that the Shia were doing our job for us. They were, of course, very much doing their own work, clearing the way, setting the conditions for a fundamentalist Shia-dominated South. And that's exactly what was predicted in the Yunnan plan and in the clear break I mentioned earlier. In practical terms, this meant horror and fear for ordinary Sunni citizens and Christians, as well as for ordinary Shias, most of whom simply wanted peace and quiet to get on with their lives. And pretty soon, this is me talking, I'm not reading now, pretty soon you saw a complete absence of women wearing Western clothes, because to do so would invite attacks from the Shias. Women were being attacked, women were being killed. Anyone who was not regarded as a devout Shia, was a target. So I I must emphasize that. Getting back to the book, not everyone in the units on the ground was convinced that it was the now-beleaguered Sunnis, FRLs, non-existent Al-Qaeda, who represented the real threat. While set-piece operations searched largely fruitlessly for often illusory opponents, note how he dismissed the notion of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, Deeply unpleasant things were happening to Basrawis who did not meet the standards of the radical Shia militias. I remember a conversation with an infantry sergeant in December 2003. He was disturbed by having stumbled almost literally upon a torture chamber being used by Thar Allah, Fist of God, one of the militias operating in the city. He was concerned that this group and others like it were, quote, literally getting away with murder, unquote. Infantry units such as the sergeants were on constant patrol. 
they were beginning to realize that something was dangerous was happening. This was a realization largely lost on the elite military intelligence units operating in the city. Shia gangs and death squads were not confining their attentions to former Ba'athists or even Sunni elements. The previously tolerant society of Basra, a cosmopolitan port city, had no attractions for these men, many of whom had spent years in Iran before the liberation. Alcohol sellers, women who did not wear the veil or who had spoken to foreigners, academics and Christians were all potential targets for kidnap and torture. As the police force was formed, it started to become clear to the soldiers on the ground that all was not well with it. This was not surprising. The militias were the police. Very key point. We were not the only gang. To any soldiers speaking to Basrawis, it was apparent that there was a very great deal of fear in the city. Fear not of us, but of religious fanatics. The university, with which I had a great deal of involvement, was being cleared, quote-unquote, of elements deemed unsatisfactory to Shia's parties. On the streets, it became very rare to see women in Western clothes, Western clothes such as jeans. Had the British devoted a little more effort to looking out at the people they had liberated, they would have seen that Basra was rapidly becoming a law-free zone. After the wholesale looting and destruction following the liberation, quote-unquote, Security for Basrawis remained very poor indeed. There was no police force nor anything resembling one. Kidnappings, carjackings, and robbery were the least of the problems. The reprisal killings that were to characterize the next two years were underway. It was not long before they turned into a wholesale program of ethnic cleansing of tens of thousands of Sunnis and Christians. This is a hitherto unreported aspect of the war in southern Iraq. Human Rights Watch, a professional and balanced non-governmental organization, reported that no effort was made to constitute a working legal or judicial system. In view of the experience of Kosovo and Bosnia, this is an extraordinary lapse and was to have severe consequences as soldiers found themselves in a confusing legal limbo when confronted with criminality. In an atmosphere such as that, the situation is ripe for any group to set itself up as the arbiter of justice, including British soldiers, and, and in due course, that is exactly what happened. Okay, this next part is key. Meanwhile, as the British congratulated themselves on their acumen, the Shias militias were building their own forces with the active assistance of Iran. In military terms, the Shias militias were setting the conditions for their own return to the military scene in a rather major way in 2004. The British, ensconced in the very heartland of the Iranian-influenced South, were not interested in interfering. Instead, they reasoned the solution to the bubbling problem of the militias would be to co-opt them into the police. So their solution to dealing with these Shias are going around lopping people's heads off and stoning women, etc., was to bring them into the police force. This situation continued until one particular day, the day when the consequences of a failure to grasp the civic situation became all too apparent. As General Stewart, general officer commanding at the time, put it, 6 April 2004 was a day on which, like a flick of the switch, the British moved into insurgency overnight. Traditionally, in their successful campaigns, the British regarded the police as an essential auxiliary arm. In Northern Ireland, the police had been the single most important security force. The army, for most of that campaign, had been strictly subordinate in keeping with traditional ideas of civilian primacy. In Basra, the police were thought of as a ticket out of the disorder that was beginning to unfold around the army. The same approach was seen in Helmand. On the face of it, this was a sensible approach, but in practice, it was heavily dependent on recruiting the right people. After all, even in Northern Ireland, it took eight years to build the Royal Ulster Constabulary up to a point where it could assume primacy. From 2003, the new police consisted of a loosely linked agglomeration of uniform armed groups, also known as militias. This was a deliberate decision by the British in the hope that it would give them all a stake in a new government security structure. 
Unfortunately, no effort was made to win over the loyalty of these militias to the new structure, and neither were mechanisms established to oversee it. The uniforms they wore were police uniforms supplied by Britain. In permitting this, the British had legitimized the militias. Worse, they had handed over to them the job of maintaining law and order. The only Western journalist living in Basra, Stephen Vincent, spent some days embedded with the UK forces. He was not complimentary about their approach. In one particular article, he reported that half of the police supported and trained by the British Army were members of radical religious parties. The result was ever-increasing oppression of what remained of the city's less visibly devout majority. Quote, Hundreds of murders of former Bathists were taking place every month, and many of them were perpetrated by the same police. The British were turning a blind eye to all of this. Vincent was kidnapped and killed on 3 August 2005, three days after that article was published. This is where it gets really crazy. Serious crimes. The worst of the police teams that were initially supported and trained by the British was the Serious Crimes Unit, or SCU, an apt name for what was a gang of rapists, torturers, and murderers who took orders not from the governor, but from Maktada al Sadr. As the years drew on, the SCU became synonymous with terror for Basrawis and more than a nuisance for the British. In September 2005, two Special Air Service Special Forces men were captured by police and taken to the SCU headquarters. There, they were seriously mistreated, beaten up. It is now apparent that an agreement had been made to hand them on to a militia unit where they would be held as hostages. It is highly likely that their lives were saved by action on the part of their comrades the next day. A senior military officer is quoted by the Daily Telegraph. The Serious Crimes Unit is one of the major organs that contribute to death squads in Basra. They dress in police uniform, use police cars, police pistols, and will murder just for political or criminal gain. The SCU are a significant part of death squad activity in Basra. The officer did not say what everyone knew, that they were a British creation. You can't make this stuff up. The very group or groups, rather, of hardcore Shia fanatics in the south of uh, Iraq that were stoning women, killing people indiscriminately, were brought into the police force. And the hardcore, most evil gang of them, gangs of rapists, killers, and torturers, were put into the serious crimes unit. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. And the point of relevance is... We're seeing the same thing in America now. Have been seeing it in in Great Britain, in the UK, where these Islamist murderers and rapists are given a slap on the wrist, if that, turn loose, and this just encourages them to behave even more evilly, if that's a word. Meanwhile, they're shutting down free speech, censoring those who are complaining about all the stabbings and murders and rapes going on. And we've already started seeing that in America. There was that Somali cop in, where was it, Milwaukee or Minneapolis. He gunned down a white Australian woman who called the police because there was a prowler sneaking around her house in the middle of the night. She goes out into an alleyway behind her house to meet with the cops. The cop car pulls up. Uh, and this Islamic Somali guy, who's a cop, pulls his service weapon out and shoots the lady. And we're now seeing Venezuelan gangs causing all these problems. There are reports that gangs have started harassing the truckers that are going to North Carolina to bring provisions, water, and supplies. And these gangs, presumably... Venezuelan, I'll find out for sure, but I'm guessing they're Venezuelans, are demanding tariff money from the truckers. Remember, I talked about how the warlords in Afghanistan were 
demanding all these tolls and tariffs and, and bribes, running all these checkpoints and running all these border crossings. Well, these Venezuelan and other immigrant gangs are doing the same thing in America now. And supposedly they're, they're slashing the tires of truckers who don't want to pay these extortion fees in order to bring supplies to the beleaguered survivors in North Carolina. I'm not going to refer to them as gangs anymore, Venezuelan gangs. They're a foreign militia group, a foreign militia force that's been allowed to run amok in America. No different than the uh, Muqtada al Sadr Sharia uh, army that's been turned loose in Basra. It's a militia force. Meanwhile, they're trying to get rid of militias, homegrown American militias in America, but they're turning loose all these foreign militias. And they are a protected species. We've seen the video of people telling police in Colorado, these Venezuelan gangs, uh, Venezuelan militias, are taking over apartment complexes. Do something about it. Arrest them. What does the cop say? This is on camera. This is on video. The cop says, this is a sanctuary city. We can't do anything. So they deliberately turn a blind eye and let these foreign militias come in, because that's what they are, and run amok, take over. They become the law and order, if you will. They are the ones who harass, kidnap, steal, murder, and they do it with impunity. No one's stopping them, certainly not the police. The Venezuelan militias in New York City have been armed by the Democrats. And chances are we're going to see the Haitians armed. We're going to see other militia groups in the U.S. armed to go after the citizenry. In the time I got left in this commentary, I want to talk about Pakistan and the Islamic bomb. The U.S. not only turned a blind eye to the atomic bomb project of AQ Khan, they not only ran interference for AQ Khan, they actively funded his operation through the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCI, and probably other financial conduits. This on top of the wholesale espionage, technology transfer, if you will, out of our national laboratories in Los Alamos and other places. Since there is now a pipeline of all these terrorists coming out of Central Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, into the West, we've all seen the video of the Taliban parading around in all of the American military hardware and vehicles that have been left behind for them. To me, it is not beyond the realm of possibility that terrorists trained by the Pakistanis, perhaps supported by the Chinese, CCP, can bring into the United States and to the West in general, but the United States in particular, what are described as small atomic demolition munitions, SADMs. If Pakistan has not yet developed the capability to make SADMs, so-called backpack nukes, suitcase nukes. I would be surprised at this point if they don't know how to make them. They can at least buy them on the black market. Or, worst case, they can disassemble a nuclear weapon and then reassemble it on site. So they can bring in, through a number of different couriers, the components for a nuclear weapon bring them into America, reassemble them. And I'm thinking not just one of these, but a number of them and set them off. And I would think that they would not only go after soft targets, but they would also go after military targets too, considering how the Chinese have bought up so much land and property adjacent to U.S. military bases I don't want to give them any ideas, but there's a number of targets that come to mind. 
on the west coast. Yeah, Naval Air Station Whidbey Island, where a number of the electronic warfare squadrons, the VAQ squadrons, are based at. Other places like Norfolk, Virginia, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and also if they wanted to go after soft targets, they can go after some of the banks in Wall Street, the ones that are not part of the inner club. The financial cartel would be glad to have some of these other banks knocked off. It'll just give them the excuse to bring in the digital currency that much sooner. So I'm just thinking out loud how a terrorist would think. Okay, they would go after certain targets. And there would probably be a lot of them, not just one or two or three or four. I think there would be a number of these. It's not beyond the realm of possibility that this can happen. Uh, a lot of focus is directed at the possible thermonuclear war between the the West, so-called, and Russia, and that is an ever-present danger. But we mustn't lose sight of the fact that Pakistan, an Islamist state, has an Islamic bomb, and they are not afraid to use it. So I just wanted to leave you with that. And one final thought, what they've done in North Carolina, creating this artificial hurricane, and then the dam is overflowing, supposedly, or do they open the sluices and let the water pour through intentionally? Because they've done things like that before. That's how they flooded the lower ninth ward in New Orleans during Katrina. They opened the locks and allowed New Orleans to be flooded. So what this shows is, and we've already known this, but now it's really coming to a head, that they're pulling out all the stops. They're shooting for all the marbles. So we must steal ourselves for what's coming down the pike. So anyhow, I just wanted to put these thoughts out there. As always, I encourage you to do your own research. Don't take anything I say at face value. Check it out for yourself. Do your own research to validate or invalidate everything I've said. Because everything I've said, as far as I'm concerned, and as far as my research and investigations uh, tell me, everything that I've described is within the realm of possibility. They're not fantastical or they're not impossible. And if there's anything that we've learned just the last few years, nothing is impossible at this point. I'm the ultimate skeptic. I don't put anything past these evil sewer scum. But in the end, we shall triumph. So anyhow, thank you for listening. And wherever you may be, whatever you may be doing, have a very pleasant time. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.